Hi there. Welcome back to 19th Century Art. In this, our second part to Post-Impressionism, we will look at Gauguin, Cezanne, and Toulouse-Lautrec. In our last lecture, we talked about Vincent van Gogh and his relationship with Paul Gauguin and how important that was to van Gogh to have Gauguin's support and how quickly he fell apart after Gauguin's departure from the south of France. Gauguin was a very charismatic man, and he was an investment banker before a financial crash. He loses his job. He takes a class in, in sculpture. He likes hanging out with the Impressionists. He's a very gregarious and social man who has a wide circle of these new artist friends who find him fascinating. And so as his finances deteriorate, he decides instead of going on as a banker, he wants to become a full-time artist. He demonstrates a willingness to really break out of the conventions of the past. And this boldness of color and light in the north of France really pushes him to this new form of abstraction. He's looking for something more primitive. And I use the word here to, to really describe this fantasy he has of a simpler life, uh, an older way of being, not attached to the conventions of the classical past, but something even older, something more foundational in human existence. And so he pursues this idea wherever he goes. You can see here an early work of the Four Baton Woman from 1886. And there's a lovely softness, and, and yet there's a flatness that he's clearly deriving from the ideas of Japanese. Here we see he goes into this idea of the mythic realm the women here are having this vision after having been to a sermon. And so we see Jacob wrestling with the angel in this vision and the piety of the women and their wonderful sculptural hats and the way the tree frames them in relationship to this mythic event. So he spent the summer of 1886 in this artist colony in pont avin brittany He was attracted in the first place because it was a cheap place to live there. He found himself an unexpected success with the young art students who flocked there in the summer. He returned to the village in 1888 to stay until mid-October when he left to join Vincent van Gogh in the south, where he stayed for more than two months. Before he left, we see this portrait of Gauguin. He's doing this yellow Christ. And this, I think, was a, an important painting for him. We see a self-portrait of him with the yellow Christ. And he's flanked himself between it and this other odd-shaped visage, a darker form. I think Gauguin realized he was wrestling with some demons at this time. And the yellow Christ himself has some kind of martyr. And this other form is ceramics that he had been exploring, looking toward totems and, again, this idea of the primitive. And he sees this dark visage as some other inner turmoil in himself. Gauguin was a complicated man. And as he pursued his art career, he really abandons his family and goes about on all kinds of escapades. His ceramic work uh, again, he's always exploring this way to get at something more essential, more primitive. Here, a recurring theme of Gauguin's was Lita and the Swan, which he took to embody his passion for young girls. This is the side of Gauguin that most people have repudiated and find perfectly disgusting that this elder man would pursue 
and seduce younger girls. Now, it's one thing if it's just a fantasy he's pursuing, but we have abundant evidence that he was a wide-ranging womanizer and pushed himself upon all kinds of girls of every imaginable age. And so Lita in the Swan, he says to himself, shamed be he who thinks evil of it, as if there's something perfectly honest and ordinary about an older man pursuing underage girls. After he departs the south of France and leaves Van Gogh behind, he's desperate to find some kind of faraway primitive world where people are closer to the natural human existence. What he finds, though, is actually a fairly well-established Christian community uh, that has been cultivated in the missionary lifestyle. But what he paints is this older, more primitive idea, this fantasy that he continues to pursue. Now, the women here, he made arrangements with their parents. This is part of the way in which he was able to operate in Tahiti. Uh, it was a cheap place to live. He found some success in sending these paintings back. Of course, he was negligent in supporting his family through all this. We see time and again someone who is sort of desperately looking for some kind of innocence in this imagined primitive past. So not only was Gauguin experimenting with these ceramics and woodcuts, uh, and here he's again using the woodcut in a very crude, chiseled way to try and express something more primeval about his experiences there. And there were people in Paris who found this rather captivating and really uh, were fascinated by the way he was so daring to go out into this savage wilderness. And he really sells himself as this noble savage out there in the wilderness. His prints, each one, he varies a great deal. He's experimenting. Like William Blake, he sees each individual print as an opportunity to explore new colors, new patterns. He's not trying to create an addition of similar images. He's trying to make each one a new kind of visual experience. And so Gauguin is experimenting with all kinds of different icons and images that captivate the idea of the primitive. The theme of Oviri is death, savagery, wildness. Oviri, this is over a dead she-wolf while crushing the life out of her cub. Perhaps as Gauguin wrote to Odilon Redon, it is a matter of not death in life, but life in death. And so with this fascination with the primitive and his interest in the mythology of the Tahitians, he's coming into this new idea of symbolism. And he was very influential on other artists who would pick up this idea of uh, symbolic spiritual imagery. Perhaps one of his most successful and celebrated paintings is this large canvas, Where Do We Come From? What Are We? Where Are We Going? And the title is written in gold in Tahitian up in the left corner there. And uh, it's a masterful composition. He's really bringing this idea of the primitive spiritual life of the Tahitians into his work. He was very adamant about the rights of the Tahitians, and he often spoke out against the colonial practices uh, that were abusing the rights of the Tahitians. But he was a bit of a freak, and the Tahitians didn't really see them uh, as any kind of one of their own. And the 
colonialists thought he was just this repulsive man who uh, hung out in the most despicable manner. So here we have one of his last paintings. He has failing health, and he's really inspired by Degas. And you can see that his treatment of the colors, uh, the figures in space, uh, there's this wonderful flat experience and the, the flat horizon that's a characteristic of Japanese woodblock prints and this wonderful way in which the figures interact. Degas also was really into horses in compositions. Unfortunately, our understanding of Degas is really cut short by his death in Tahiti. His estate there is auctioned off and lots and lots of paintings that were found in his cabin were burned and destroyed by the missionaries there who thought his work was pornographic. Now, the other extraordinary post-Impressionist that is really influential going forward is Paul Cezanne. And this is really remarkable because for much of his life, he was ridiculed and thought an abject loser. His work was seen as heavy-handed, clumsy, awkward. Nobody understood what he was trying to do. You see his uh, portrait of his father reading, and this chair, what's going on with that chair? The legs are wrong. This is massive, solid looking back to the chair. The, this is actually a really large painting. I, I was surprised to see it in Chicago when there was a big Cezanne exhibit a couple of years back. And uh, yeah, it was really quite enormous, even monumental. And, and yet it, there's also a kind of intimacy about it, a quietness about it. But then there's this very striking brown and light brown in the painting in the back. Anyways, it's a, it's a peculiar painting. We're not quite sure what to do with it. It feels very self-conscious and very heavy-handed. But the masses that he achieves here, this is the thing that Cezanne uh, really is able to get into. Now, part of the reason why people were so uh, down on Cezanne was he was actually a longtime friend of Emile Zola, who, as you remember, was the man who befriended Manet and really championed a lot of Manet's work and contemporary painting. He really wrote very supportive of a lot of things. In one of his novels, he sets up and describes these various artists, and one of them that came to be clearly identified as Paul Cezanne was a bit of a loser in the novel. And Cezanne was furious um, that he would be characterized in this manner and was in a really falling, big falling out with Zola. And this is part and part of this deep outsider qualities um, that Cezanne suffers with for much of the Impressionists who didn't quite get what he was doing. Here, there was Victor Choquet who thought Cezanne was marvelous and really enjoyed it. He did a portrait of him here one of his most adamant supporters. And you can start to see Cezanne's use of mass. It's very painterly, it's very gestural, quick way, but there's this solidity to it. Unlike the Impressionists, where things sort of begin to evaporate with just light on surface, he's building up these masses and these volumes while also maintaining this very clear flatness. So there's this tension between the flatness of the picture and the volumes that his light is uh, creating. The colors are created here again. Uh, Hortense Fique in a striped skirt. You see this wonderful undulations of colors, but there's still this form, this red chair that envelops her and the way in which the face. And again, he's playing with planes, even though we feel her skirt come toward us and there's volumes to her 
blouse and bow and hair, there is this real austere flatness to his pictures. It feels like we're looking at a Whistler painting with that stark, clear, bold shapes that Whistler used to create flatness. One of the things that Cezanne did, he was poor for so long, he could not afford models. He painted people who would suffer him enough time to sit for a painting. But he painted still lives. He, it was something that he could really get to, and he spent a great deal of time trying to understand his painting vocabulary through these endless, endless still lives. And they're fascinating. This is perhaps my favorite part of Cezanne's work, this way you can see him really wrestling with the pictorial space and the folds of the fabric and the volumes of the fruit, but also the way he's willing to mess with it, the way the cup is awkward and everything is a little akimbo. You're looking at these lines on the shelf below and nothing quite lines up. Everything feels a little bit akimbo. And we can see that very dramatically in his still lives. They, they seem to be sort of falling out of the picture plane. There's no easy place for our eyes to rest. We feel like it's a still life, a, a, a solid forms in space. But at the same time, it's a picture. And every part of the picture seems to suggest a different way that we are actually looking at it. And if you start to follow the lines of the composition, you notice that everything is just a little bit off, right? The circles that make up the plate do not conform with the top of the picture exactly. And the table suggests various lines that never quite intersect. The corner that is implied by the folds and fabric is not sustained by the actual lines implied by the surface of the table. So what we see here is this very unstable, changing composition. One of the things I like to do in this class is to look at unfinished work. And this is actually a really wonderful example of Cezanne's method because he starts out, there's no underdrawing, there's no preparatory sketch, unlike Seurat and so many other painters who carefully planned out their work. He just sort of attacks the canvas. He begins laying in volumes and shapes and these bold strokes. He's really drawing with paint and he's building up his forms and he's sort of starting in various places. He's not trying to think of it as a unified thing. He's really like going where his eye goes and following his intuition as he builds up these volumes through a variety of these slashing brush strokes. And this is the thing that Cezanne is so well known for. His brush strokes have this very distinct shape and character that is beautifully creates this energetic surface to his paintings. So again, as he continues to work in still life, the surface planes, the volumes, the shapes all start to feel very complexly arranged with no coherent volumes and spaces. And this is what he is so influential in, in the progress toward abstraction. This idea that we're not looking at things in a coherent space. We are experiencing them as we might, as we walk past them, as we look at them, our eyes fall on various parts. But ultimately, the logic of the painting is this internal logic. It doesn't require it to refer to a coherent real space, a window into a world that we are peering at. We're actually experiencing a, these things as a painting in the ways and volumes that are in play with each other within the picture plane of the painting. 
he eventually inherits some money from his father's estate and is allowed to settle down and begin to focus on landscape and other things. And this is one of his absolute favorite subjects is Mont Saint Victoire in France, where he painted it over and over and over again. And we start to see these brush strokes that he became so famous for, the way in which he's looking at volumes, but now using his brush strokes to create and build up these various planes of space in the painting. Here's another one you can where later it starts to get very abstract. And again, like the series of paintings that Monet did, this is a subject that allows him to explore the things that are matter to him most, the volumes in space and how they are arranged in the painting. And his work becomes increasingly abstract. One aspect of Paul Cézanne's work toward the end of his life, he starts painting all of these compositions with bathers. And I've tried. I have sincerely tried to make sense of his interest. I have a great respect for his still lifes and his landscapes, but these leave me cold. I cannot and have never found anything uh, that makes any sense to me why he was so obsessed with these very formal figures of bathers. And he's not really working from models. He's using them as a kind of architecture for this painting, the way the trees are bent in. I mean, everything about it seems so heavily scripted. There's, there's very little that is allowed to breathe in his paintings. The figures feel tightly grouped together and their volumes feel arbitrarily arranged to sort out to some kind of sense in the picture. He worked on the painting for seven years and it remained unfinished at the time of his death in 1906. He wanted to avoid fashion and find some kind of eternal themes. And he thought the bathers was something that was beyond the here and the now and what was happening in the world, but something eternal, some ideal classical notion of beauty. One of the most exciting of the post-impressionist painters is Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec who was just an incredible painter who had this way of looking at things and seeing things and was able to translate that so beautifully in his work. There's something so fresh and vivid and exciting about everything he does. Here's his portrait of Vincent van Gogh, and you can see this wonderful use not only of color, but the marks, the gestures, the actions that he is using to bring this very exciting surface of his drawing to life. There's a wonderful sense of intensity about the way he captures the way the posture and the action and the physical features of Van Gogh. It really speaks a lot to his attention to people and his attention to the scene in which they are around in. So Toulouse Lautrec had these physical deformities. He came from an uh, upper class family at age 13 because of genetic disorder. Uh, his left hip was fractured and then his right and then they didn't heal properly. So he was a short stunted growth, which they now attribute to the sort of inbreeding that was very common among these elite of Europe. And so he was shunned by his family because of his deformity, uh, but he found a new family in the artists of the art colony in Paris in Montmartre on the mountain outside the city. And there in the cafes and brothels, Toulouse-Lautrec hung out and painted the people going about their leisure activities. It's just this wonderful, fun, adventurous sense of color and action that he really captures so beautifully. He really done 
gone beyond what Renoir did earlier with his movement. And he's really looking at the shapes and forms of the clothing, the expressions, the styles, but in this loose way that makes you feel like you're in the middle of all this incredible action. Here's uh, the very famous dance hall called the Moulin Rouge, the R Red Windmill. It's still a feature in Montmartre today, and you can go there and see their dance acts. So one of the series of pictures that Toulouse-Lautrec was quite famous for was he hung out at the brothels and he really sympathized with the plight of the women who lived in this world dominated by men's pleasures. But he doesn't focus on the men at all. In fact, he's looking at the daily humiliations, but also the intimacy that these women shared as they came to terms with their humiliating and degrading life as prostitutes. Here on the left, we see the medical inspection from medical examiners would come in and see if the women had any kinds of parasites or lice in their genitals. Again, the sofa from 1894 to 96, oil on cardboard. A lot of times he did these on really inexpensive materials. He's painting quickly. He's capturing a moment, a gesture, an action. And the qualities that these women seem to share with each other, not performing, not out there showing off to the prostitutes, uh, showing off to their clients, as we saw with Manet, but actually this kind of existence they shared only with each other. So Toulouse-Lautrec gets interested in lithography and finds employment uh, making show posters. So this is something that he really opens up this new idea is the poster as a work of art. Uh, and he's using these bold shapes and volumes impartially inspired by Japanese art. You can see he signed his name in this circle on the lower left, Henry Toulouse-Lautrec, all the characters all put together like a Chinese stamp and that brilliant red scarf. He knew how to capture the gestures and the actions that made these celebrities of the Montmartre really stand out. Aristide Bruant was a successful singer, songwriter, and entrepreneur who ran the Cabaret in Montmartre in the quarter of Paris. And so this is part of his way of promoting these entertainments in the Montmartre district. Part of the popularity of Silhouette uh, comes from a new theater that had taken over during the World Fair. Chinese shadow puppets were performed, and the avant-garde world went crazy for this idea of shadow puppetry. And Le Chat Noir was the black cat theater in Montmartre, which did these really high-end and incredibly sophisticated shadow puppet performances that really rivaled a lot of later animation. They created these complicated characters with multiple planes of painted glass, create colors and shapes, and they would do these very long, complicated stories like the life of Napoleon as shadow puppets. It was really quite extraordinary. Here again, we see Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec in his Divan Japonais, which was an attempt to really capture, again, the fun and excitement of the entertainers of Montmartre. This wonderful poster focuses on the patrons who were there enjoying the performance. And in fact, Yvette Guibert, the performer we see only in the background with her head taken off, but her long black gloves, which were such a signature of her performance, are beautifully featured. It's as if that's the second thing we see. He's not putting the celebrity front and center, 
but instead allowing us to enjoy these wonderful caricatures of the patrons of this performance. <laughs> 